<laughs> it's good to see you again. And I'm glad that it's not cold inside. Because I, I've been cold outside at night. But right now it feels very comfortable in here. So thank you so much. I hope nobody is hot because I'm very comfortable. And it's dry. I was telling um, Annalisa, um, she was asking me, so how are you doing? And I say, it's like, I feel like in a few days I'll turn into a crocodile. <laughs> because my skin is so used to humidity that it's like starting to peel. But other than that, it has been wonderful. Um, it, you guys are amazing. And I spent some time with people in the kitchen talking to you guys, and it was fun. And I hope you enjoyed the tamales. And um, it was it was an adventure. Every time you don't use your kitchen, it's an adventure. You know, making 200 tamales in a kitchen that is not yours, that never has made tamales before, it was, was a challenge. So I'm, I'm so thankful for the people who were patient with me. I'm in the way, I like, look like I'm confused. I don't know, I look like I don't know what I'm doing, but you guys were very patient. And I hope that you, um, at least you enjoy the tamales, uh, whatever came out, because <laughs> it was an adventure. So, to start, um, let us start with that, with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to ask you to be with us. Lord, I know that whatever you have done in my life is not because of me, but because of you. And I know you, and I know that you are eternal, and that you are always the same, and that you can do whatever you have done for me for anybody else. I'm nobody special, and I want each one of the people here to hear your voice and to see you. And I pray that each person can receive a message that is for them individually. Bring your Holy Spirit to our hearts, and use me as an instrument. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So Romans 8, 28, do you remember the scripture reading? What, what does it say? All things, well, yeah, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So I remember a long time ago I heard a story, maybe some of you have heard that story too. But it's a story of a king that had a servant that was kind of his right hand and he always went with him everywhere. And so his servant was a very good Christian and he will always say, oh God is so good in every situation. He will say, God is so good. When bad things happen, this servant always said, God is so good. And when things were not the way the king wanted it, guess what he said? God is so good. Well, and we have some listeners. That's good. So when uh, things were not going good for the kingdom, guess what he said? God is so good. And you know what? The king started to get annoyed by this God is so good thing. And he, he himself, the king, believed in God, but he was annoyed that every time that he wanted to complain or be negative, the servant will always come up with a, oh, king, but God is so good. So he was like, oh, like, you know, he loved his servant, he liked his servant, but he was annoyed by him. So much. And one day they went hunting. And as they were hunting, a lion appeared and attacked the king. And so the, the soldiers and the servants were trying to help him. And finally they killed the lion. But the king lost a finger. And the king was so upset because the servants didn't do fast what they should have done. So the lion didn't eat one of his fingers. So he was so upset. And guess what the servant said? God is so good. Oh, this time it was all over. Like the king was so upset that he said, take him and put him into prison. It was his friend, but the king was so upset. He's like, when I recover and when I'm happy with you, I'm going to take you out of prison. So 
they took the servant to prison. And so a few days later, the king was like kind of doing a little better without his finger. And so he said, well, I'm going to go hunting, but I'm not going to take that servant. I'm going to punish him and I'm going to leave him in prison so he cannot say, God is so good. So he went hunting with other people, with other servants, with other soldiers. And as he went deeper into the jungle, deeper into the forest, he found a group of savages. And he was on his own for a little bit. And so these savage people captured him. And these people were, um, they, they did human sacrifices to their gods. So they took the king and they were going so fast that the soldiers could not reach to him. And so he was trapped. And then the, 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 this tribe of people, they started preparing him and they had an altar and they were putting him on the altar and while they were tying him up to sacrifice him to their god is what <coughs> they find that they he didn't have a finger so they said stop stop this person does not have a finger oh no we cannot give up like fault offering to our, our god he's incomplete uh, untie him it's not and so they were upset, but they bit him a little, and then they let him go. So he was saved by the, you know, missing a finger. So he was like, oh, I cannot believe it. My servant said that God is good. And even in this situation, God is actually good. So all the way until he finally reached a place where he found the soldiers, he was thinking about, I need to go and take my servant out of prison. And as he's going to prison, look for him personally because he was so moved by this situation that he was saved by that that he came to prison and he's talking to the servant and say i'm so sorry like that I, I i got upset and you know what god is good and so the king told him the whole story and then the king said to him but you know i still you know I, I'm, I'm glad that god is good but how can you explain the fact that i uh, unjustly put you in prison and he's like oh king God is so good because if I had been with you I never separate from you and I am complete so I, had, I should have been the sacrifice so God is so good that you put me in prison so although it's a funny story it is true that God always will do the best for us, even when it's painful, even when we don't understand. And yes, there are some things in my life that I still don't know exactly how God is working it out for good. But I believe that He is good. And I believe that as long as I am in His plan, as long as I'm following His purpose for my life, that everything that comes to me will be for good. I believe it. And I have seen, I feel like God gives us a few experiences here and there when He allows us to see that tragedy was good. Not always. Not always we understand why things happen the way it happens, but sometimes, just for the sake of our emotional life, He gives us a way to see the past and the future and present, and we can see, wow, God did it. You know, this thing that seemed to be so bad, He transformed it into something very, very good. And I, gonna tell you a, a little bit of my story that I usually only share with girls and although I only share it with girls it's not because it's girly but I feel like boys sometimes won't be able to relate to that but now I was trying to remember the story and I'm like no wait I feel like there are some things that they can get from this story so when I accepted the call and I said I'm going to be a missionary, I told you that there were some things that happened that Satan did to stop me from going as a missionary. What were some of those things, remember? Job, Job opportunities. There was at least one more that I mentioned. 
Depression. Oh, okay, depression. Yeah, that was that was one. But the comments of other people. You know, other people were telling me, yeah, that's not a good idea, you're crazy, you're wasting your life. So those things were kind of obstacles on the way. But there was one more thing I didn't tell you. And is that right after I made that decision, I had a friend. It was not a girlfriend, it was a boyfriend. And he, well, we were friends for a few years, but after I decided to become a missionary, he started to look for me in a more, you know, that way. And so I really like him, and we started, you know, a relationship, and I realized I'm like, no, I need to, I need to be, I need to be uh, honest with him. Because I already made my mind in going as a missionary, and I don't want him to tell me later, but you never told me. So as soon as we were starting the relationship, I went to him and I said, well, you know, I, I feel like you are looking something with me, and I do like you too, but um, I want to be a missionary for a year. He, although we were the same age, uh, I did high school, in two years instead of three. Mexico, you have different different school years. So he did high school in three years, I did high school in two years. So he was one year behind at university. So I was about to graduate and he was still missing one more year to finish university. And we were both studying education. So I said, I, I know you want to start a relationship, but if you are not uh, if you don't agree with me doing a year of missions, I think we, we better don't start because I'm going to do it. You know, I, I do like you, but I'm going to do it. And so he's like, oh, no, no problem. I think that you should do it. You know, like, oh, I, I admire girls that are so missionary minded. <laughs> because he loved missionary-minded girls. Now, he loved missionary-minded girls, but he himself was not a missionary-minded person. He, he was just trying to get what he wanted, you know? So, but I didn't know at that moment, so I said, so are you okay with me going for you? Oh, yes, no problem, he said. I will support you, I will pray for you, and, and I say, but are you sure you can wait for a year? Like, I'm not gonna be here. So I know there are people who, you know, long distance relationships are not very good. And that uh, is not very healthy. So I don't want to put you in a position where you have to struggle with that. I know myself and I'm pretty committed, but I don't know how you feel. And he's like, oh no, I love you so much that no matter what, I am going to wait for you. Okay. It sounded like a plan, so we started dating. We started a relationship. And as the relationship kept moving, a few months later, we started talking about marriage. And so things started to get, things started to get a little deep. And I remember one day he told me, since you're gonna go for a year, why don't we set up the date for, for the wedding? That would be better. So that way, when you come back, we just get married. And I said, are you sure? He's like, oh yes, I'm completely sure. We should have a date before you leave. That way everybody knows. That way, you know, we have everything ready and we're not struggling later like to get all the things. And I, I, was, I was in love, so yes, of course, let's do it. And so he talked to his parents. His parents lived seven hours from Monte Morelos, and he asked the parents to come all the way to Monte Morelos to go to my house and ask my mom my hand in marriage. And so they came, and we did the little thing, and his parents were very Christian, they were very spiritual minded, and so they did a very nice 
uh, ceremony, he had a, a brother-in-law that was a pastor, so even the brother-in-law came, and then he did the whole ceremony. I didn't even know there was a ceremony for that, but they were so formal, and I was like, oh, that's so good that I'm getting a person that's so spiritual, and, and you know, I was excited. Um, I remember that we set up a date. We actually sent invitations for the wedding. Uh, we actually got to see the places where, where we're going to have the wedding. And I remember I went to look for dresses. And my mom said, I don't think you should buy the dress. And I said, why? Like, you know, we want to have everything ready. She says, what if you get fat? <laughs> I mean, I'm going to the mission field. You don't get fat in the mission field. Well, now I, I know that you do, but in that time I didn't know. And so I'm like, I don't think I'm going to get, why did you get skinnier? Good thing she didn't say, why did you get shorter? Uh, that didn't apply. But I said, it's okay. Um, she was so adamant about me not getting the dress that I actually didn't get it. And I say, okay, I will, I will wait. Um, when I come back, I'll have like four months. And I think four months is enough for me to get a dress because I didn't want anything like too fancy, too expensive. So I said, okay, to my mom, advice. And that was good. So um, we plan everything, we send invitations. And then one month before I left for Bolivia, because I was gonna go as a missionary to the jungle in Bolivia, he started saying things like, oh, I know you love your dreams more than me, but I will survive. I'm like, wait, what are you playing? Like, I told you from before we started dating, and now you're sounding like I betrayed you, I, I, you know, I, I, that I did something to you. This is not fair. And I said, if, if you start like talking like that, we better stop this. No, 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 I didn't mean to say that. I said that I know you love the Lord more than me, and that is okay. Uh, you didn't say that the first time. So, so I was starting to get a little nervous with this situation. So I talked really, really straightforward with him, and I say, see, I really love you. I want to have a, a family with you. I want to, you know, I want to marry you. I, when I said yes, it was not because I was joking or thinking about other things. I'm being serious. But are you being serious? Because we can stop this right here. No, he, he was even offended. Like, why are you saying I do love you too and this and that and the other? And I say, well, then, then should we keep on moving? Yes, yes, no, no, don't forget, forget what I said, it was just a mistake and this and that. Okay, so I left, but I left with a little, not in my heart, thinking like, is this actually going to work? But when I, I get to Bolivia, and there's some other stories in between that I'll tell you later, but I wanna keep on going with this one. When I reached Bolivia, I realized that in the jungle where I was gonna be as a missionary, there was no reception for, for cell phone, or phone, or internet, or electricity. There was not even electricity. So I knew that once a week I could go to town, once a week. And I didn't have a phone. And I entered every time I, I went, every week, once a week, I will pay to use internet at a cafe internet and send my lovely emails to my boyfriend. I sent every week faithfully an email. But he was strange because he never answered back. And I'm thinking, is he okay? And I remember calling my mom. Mom, have you seen him? She's like, yeah, I saw him at the university. And he said hi, and he said, tell Kayla hi. Oh, I said, okay, I didn't want my mom to worry about this, and I didn't want to tell her that he was not writing anything back to me. And I asked her, can you tell him like, to please be at the house at this time so I can call him? She's like, yeah, yeah, look for him. And I remember calling that day because I had to pay to use a phone to call home. And so I was expecting 
expecting him to be there. And my mom said, like, you know what? He had a surgery two weeks ago in his eye. And so he says that he's gonna he's not gonna be able to come for the call. So I just talked to my mom and I said, Oh, maybe it's because of the surgery that he hasn't been able to, you know, see the emails, you know, the eye, the email, all those things. So I was like, Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure it's because of that. I'm sure it's because of that. And like a month passed. And during this month, I, you know, I, I was in depression and I reached Bolivia and then I finally see something totally different from what I have ever seen. I, I know what a atmosphere in a university is, I know the atmosphere in a school, but never, I never experienced a mission feel like that. And the people who are there, they're happy, they're working really hard, they don't receive any payment, there are miracles happening, people pray and things happen, there's no food, and then they pray, and then there's food, and you know, all these miracles, and I'm seeing all these things and saying like, wow, this is another world. And I remember going into the dorm, because they put me as the dean, and I go to the dorm every night and work with the girls, and the girls are telling me all their problems. And some of them are depressed. And they're asking for advice, and I'm like, oh, you only knew. You know, like, I was struggling with the same things they were struggling. I was 21, and some of my students were 20, 19, 18, 17. I, 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 I didn't, I couldn't tell them, but I had to find strength from somewhere to give them, to give them that. And I remember that was changing me. That was, you know, some of those girls, well, not some of those, you know, at that school, 90% of the girls have been raped or sold in a, in a sexual way before they reach 12, most of them. So, so you have these girls that have been facing stuff that I don't even understand, and now I'm here depressed by some things that when I see their problem, they have no mom, they have no dad, nobody wants them, uh, people have abused them in many ways, and now I start realizing, you know what, I cannot even complain. And so God is showing me this new world. I feel like I can be a blessing for them. And I start feeling like I want my boyfriend to come here and be a missionary with me. And I remember praying every day, God, change his heart. He told me, I remember I told him, maybe one day we can do missions together. And he said, yes, we can do it here in Mexico. Okay. I'm like, I, it's okay with me because I love you, but what if one day we can go? And then I remember him always saying like, that is your call, it's not my call. And I say, yeah, it's true, it's true. I'm gonna go one year, I'm gonna come back, and I'm gonna marry him, and we're gonna have a mission here together. That was my idea. And But I remember being in, in Bolivia, every day praying for him. God, change his heart. God, change his heart. Make him want to be a missionary. Maybe one day we can come here and work together. Because I love this world. I love what I'm experiencing. So I'm going to the school, back to the school, and I'm crying. I'm good thing the person that's in front of me that's riding the bike, he cannot see me. And he cannot hear me because it's so noisy. So I'm crying and crying and crying. And I remember reaching reaching the school, going out the motorcycle, I went into my room and I just cried and cried and cried. And I started thinking, what am I going to tell the people who were, you know, all excited and what am I going to do and like, if this is going to be so shameful. And I'm just thinking of all the terrible things and he doesn't love me and I love him anyways and maybe he will change his mind and I'm, I'm just thinking of all these options and I, my heart is broken and at that moment I felt like, you know, life is not good at all. And I cried and cried all that night. But I remember in the morning when I woke up, and well, they were teaching me, because I didn't do it, to have my personal devotions. Imagine, I'm a pastor's daughter. But I didn't have personal devotions. I knew you had to read your Bible, but I didn't know you had to do it every day. I mean, it's good enough to go to church and open your Bible when you're reading a scripture reading. But I didn't know much, and I remember people were teaching me, so I remember looking at my Bible and saying, I don't even want to study today. I feel so sad. 
And then suddenly, something came to my mind. I had prayed just like a week ago, and I had said, God, I love this life. But I cannot, I cannot <coughs> tell this guy no because I love him and I want that life too. So if you want me to have this mission life, you have to take him out of my life because I'm not going to say no. I'm not a person that goes back. I'm not a person that just, you know, betrays someone. If I say yes, I'm going to marry him unless you do something. And then it clicks and it's like, oh, wait. I can be a missionary forever? <gasps> and then, you know, it was like some window was open and I'm like, I'm so excited. And that terrible pain that I went through, it was done. I was like, you know what? I can be a missionary. I felt so trapped because I knew I needed to go back and marry him and maybe lose that experience that I was having. So from then, I decided, you know what? Now I am free to decide wherever I want to decide. And I do want to be a missionary. And I started feeling that commitment right then. I want to be a missionary all my life. Well, <coughs> that was a decision that will bring, was going to bring me so much pain. But I didn't know at that moment, so I was so excited, and I started telling people, you know, I'm not going to stay only one year. I think I, I want to stay for longer, and I started talking to people, and it started making me feel better. Now, there's more stories, but I'm going to finish this section of the story. So, because I was not going to now stay only for a year, and the school year in Bolivia ended, ended in November, I decided to change my plane ticket and go back to Montemorelos instead of June, December. I moved it. I was so on fire for missions. I wanted to go back and tell all my friends and tell all the people, you should be a missionary. And I changed my ticket. And I remember going back to Montemorelos and it was December and it was the last day of classes and I was thinking, is he here? I, I want to go to the school, but I don't want to see him. So I said, he doesn't, he didn't know I changed my plate ticket. And so I said, well, I'm going to wait until it's the end of class. It's like the end of the day when everybody goes home. It's like lunchtime because teachers stay. And I had some friends that were teachers that I wanted to meet. And I remember uh, saying, I'm going to wait until 12. And when 12, it was 12, I started walking and I see his truck in the parking spot. Ah, I said, he is in the school. And I said, no, I'm going to go back home and I'm going to wait until he's not there. But then I said, Kayla, just face it. You will face it sometime at some point in your life. Why, why not today? You didn't do anything. Just go enter that school and look for your friends and do what you were coming to do. So I put all of my courage together and I started walking. To enter the education department, the education school, you have like 10 steps to walk up. It's like, it's a big, you know, it's like a lot of steps. And so I'm there and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna, and then I, I thought about it. What am I gonna do if I see him? I have to be prepared because if not, what if I cry? What if I, I don't know what I'm gonna do. So I said, well, if I see him, I'm going to say, hello, good morning. And I'm going to just keep walking. I have it, everything under control. And so I start going up the stairs. And guess what? He opens the door and starts walking out. And so I remember I felt like something was going to happen to me. But I said, no, I have it all planned. So I walk by. He's opening the door. And he looks at me like if he has seen a ghost. And I say, hello, good morning. And I just kept walking. <laughs> and when I, when I finally crossed him, I was like, oh, oh, like, you know, but I, I did it. And so I kept walking. And then I, I reached uh, my, my teacher's um, office. And I remember entering the office. And she's like, Kayla, oh, what are you doing here? I didn't know you were coming. And I said, yeah, I changed my ticket. I wanted to visit 
because there's three months of vacation time and I didn't know what else to do in Bolivia, so I came. She's like, oh good, hey, she said, I heard that you're not marrying this guy anymore. And I said, no, no, he, he finished their relationship. And she says, I'm so glad you did. And I'm like, what? Yeah, we, we here at the school, all the teachers, we felt like he was not for you. And I said, why didn't you tell me? I mean, like now everybody's happy, and when I told them I was going to get married, they said they were all happy too. So I'm like, that is not fair. And it's like that I, I have made my mind, and I said, I'm never going to do that to other people. If I feel like there's something that should not happen, it's better for me to say, I'm going to be praying for you. I don't think it's for you, but I'll be praying for you so God can help you make that decision. Because that can actually affect people's decision. If you feel like there's something wrong with that relationship, why to say, I'm so happy for you? That's a lie. And I realized later that all my teachers were thinking the same way, but nobody told me. And I said, well, I don't understand why. Like, I see him and he looks like a good guy. Maybe he was just, you know, too, too far away from me. But I said, I'm not going to ask. I'm not going to look for him. But I remember one night, well, they told me that he already had a girlfriend. Imagine that. Like, three months after he told me that, that the relationship was over, she, he already had a girlfriend. And the girlfriend was one of our friends, our mutual friends. So it was fine. I, I, by then, I didn't care too much about him anymore or her. I said, well, good for him. You know, he got a person, and I got the mission field, and I'm happy with that. No problem. But I remember one night, one of the teachers asked me to come and help her lead, not lead, but take care of a test. There was this extraordinary test that they, she had to do, but she had to have two classrooms, and she wanted me to come and supervise one classroom while she was doing other classroom. And so I said yes. So it was like 7.30 when there's no classes, but she, she was going to have this test. And I remember entering the same office, the, sorry, the same um, classroom area, and I enter, I go up the steps, and the, the hallway, it's dark because it's nighttime and they, they don't have very many lights on. So I see it, it's like kind of dark. There's a few hallways on the side that are on and you can see the reflection on the main hallway, but it's, it's dark. And I see that there's a bench, um, there were several benches, but there's a bench where there's two people there. And I see that there's two people in that bench and I'm like, oh, like, I wonder who's there. But I say, well, it's not a problem because I'm just gonna turn. Uh, but there's a rule at university where you should not be girls and boys together in the dark. So I knew that they, because I could see there was a girl and a boy, I'm like, I think they're breaking the rules, you know, I don't know who they are, but I'm not a teacher here, so I'm just not going to do anything because I don't know them. <coughs> but as I'm walking closer, I realize that is the guy, and he's with the girl. And I can see that they're hugging each other, and it's dark, so I couldn't see more, but I see that they're very close to each other. And I'm like, oh, well, I'm just going to walk and just turn, because they were right where the turn was for the other two classrooms, so I said, I'm just going to walk. And when, when I thought it was him and his girlfriend that were breaking the rules. But no, it was the best friend of the girlfriend. The girlfriend was doing the test in one of the classrooms because when I entered, I was there to supervise the girlfriend of my boyfriend that was doing a test. So at that moment, I saw with my own eyes that God is good and He is so good. So there are times in life when you don't see it. There are times where God does not allow you to see the future and to know what He was saving you from. But there are times that for your sake, He shows you what you were being saved from. And in this situation, yes, I know it was hard. Yes, other people say, oh, poor Kayla, poor Kayla. No, no not for me. It's good that God did that for me. Because imagine me losing the opportunity to be a missionary for someone that didn't love me the right way or was not a faithful person. What a nightmare. What a miserable life. You may have something today, and that 
that's why I think this applies for boys too. Maybe you have something, maybe it's not a girlfriend, but maybe something, some dream that you have and that you have been cherished and you want that to happen and then suddenly God says no and takes it from you. And you may think God is so mean. Why is he taking this good thing from me? You don't know anything. You don't know what's happening behind. You don't know what's in the dark. You don't know the hearts. Don't complain when God takes something from you because he will never do something for the bad, for, for, for hurting you. He will always do something for the good. And if you love the Lord and if you want to follow him, he will never take something good without, something good without giving you something better. Never. Never. And, and yes, I am not married yet. I say yet because who knows? You know, I've heard people that marry when they're 60, so everything can happen. <laughs> but let me tell you that that is not the rule in missionary work. I'm a special case. But a lot of people get married in the mission field with missionaries. We have a school, it's called MOVE, and you have heard of it. And we have a lot of MOVE people that marry MOVE people. And you know what? It's amazing. They're going in the same direction. They both want to be missionaries. And they, those relationships are great. Why? Because they have the same call. When you have a call and the other person does not have the same call, even if you love them lots, it won't fix the issues that will come up later. Love won't fix those things because it, it won't. It will just make the, the relationship and marriage will make it worse. So don't think that it's going to get better. If right now you're not looking life in the same direction, you don't have the same call, you want to do things different, it's not going to get better. Don't keep going with that relationship. Don't keep like trying to fix it and give all these excuses and telling the girl I love missionary minded girls. Don't say those things. It's better to let go. Don't accept that girl. <laughs> if, they, if they tell you, hey, I love missionary minded girls, they don't believe it. You have to see that they have a missionary mind themselves. And it's the same for you. You know how many Guys have left mission field because of a girl. Lots. And it's so sad. You know why? Because there's so few really good men in mission field. Really, really few. Very few. So if you are called by God to do an amazing work in the mission field and you waste it for a girl, that's a sin. You're taking someone from the mission field and then on top of that, you're making your life miserable. Don't do that. If you have a call, get a girl that has a call too. And then you will have an amazing life. I know missionaries that have amazing lives because they get a person that works with them. So girls, you want to follow someone that's following God. You don't want to follow someone that is following the world and then tell you, you're so beautiful and I will love you all my life with all my heart and all the stars of the sky are yours. <laughs> and then I'll bring you the sun down and you can burn. with all his might, with all his heart. You want a person that shows with actions that he is going to be there for you at any time because he's there for God at any time. If he's not there for God for any time, it's a liar. Now don't believe a thing. So girls and boys, both, this is important. That decision of who you're going to get connected with for your whole life can make your life miserable. It can be hell on earth. Or it can be heaven on earth. It's a very important decision. And I know that hormones at this age are like really, really high and you're just dreaming with that day. But you know, you have to be careful. And you have to shower your eyes if you need to before you make a decision. Because it's important. Your whole life, your happiness, your service for God, your influence in this world depends on who you're working with. And yeah, I, I, I'm not married, so I'm not talking, you, you know,
know, I always tell people that I can give advice on marriage because I'm not married. <laughs> I can give advice on children because I have no children. Because when I have children, I won't know anything. And when I'm married, I won't know anything. So right now is the time for me to give you advice. Because if I get married, I won't know anything. And I, you know, I know now. So listen to me. something from you, praise Him. You may not know now, but you will know in, in the eternal life that was the best blessing you have. So let's ask Him to bless our lives and to help us make good decisions for His honor and glory. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I know that each one of us are dreaming to have <coughs> Have a place where we can work for you. Have a call, a purpose. Lord, and I know we have, but some, some of us still may not know exactly what it is. Lord, I pray for each young person here. Guide them so in any decision they make, they can be on the road to accomplish the goals you have for them. Help them to find that person, if it's your will, a person that can be with them at any circumstance when things are rough, when things are easy, that can love you, that, that, that can love you so much that will never sacrifice any principle. I pray, Lord, that if you ask them to remain single for your honor and glory, that you can give them an amazing, happy, and, and purposeful life, that you can help them to feel your presence and not to be lonely, but to be full of company because they're serving others, they're loving others. Lord, I pray that whatever you ask for them, that they can rejoice that you know what is best. Give them joy, give them peace, and help them to think clearly when it's time to make decisions that are so important like this. Thank you for helping me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for being so good to me, Lord. And I pray that you can be the same God for them too. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.